What's the question posed for this convocation as we begin together this morning? The theme, stewardship of knowledge, evangelizing our culture, seeking to convert by means of imparting truth, are not terms I would have chosen. So I offer a sort of rewording that I think remains aligned with what we are charged to ponder in these two days, but suits a little better what I want to do. Tending our sacred texts and being tended by them, my rewording, involves a shepherding image, implies we are both shepherds who tend and sheep who are tended, and that the common journey is for our mutual good. Our tending of what we say we know and believe and wish to share is participative for all involved, not simply for one partner. Tending includes the idea of coming to know our texts intimately, shaping, interpreting, influencing them, also extending the texts as we move along various paths for others and for ourselves. Tending texts is mutually engaging for us, for the texts, for others who are addressed as we think about how we wish to address words to our world. Our tending appropriately involves, in my view, less a managing a set of truths we offer than a willingness to be challenged by them as well. The occasion, as we know, is the culmination of the 800th Jubilee of the Order of Preachers, that band of men and women who gathered around St. Dominic and whom he gathered around him, again, mutual tending, to care for souls, for lives. As Dominic prayed, he often asked God, what will become of souls, or as we might say, of human and even creaturely lives, our own and those of others. The texts I want to tend with us are biblical, spirit, scriptural, but what I am urging holds for other texts as well that need sharing, tending, to fill them fuller as language, sacred in its own way, discloses God's w ways to us. How do we read and preach, tend, so as to bring forth evoke truthfulness, meaning, integrity more richly into all our lives. How to extend and receive these gifts in our day. Our times are not the same as any others in the 800 year span of Dominican life, and yet they are not so wholly different. So the end of a jubilee and the start of our 2017 spring term is a great occasion to talk with each other about how to grow and extend truth, not a limited good, to our multiple subcultures, the circles within which we live, struggle, and thrive. What's our challenge? How this offering will move from its kickoff and how it will grow in the two days depends on where you wish to go, what others offer, how we manage together how we will hear these words deeply and move them into our lives and those of the people we love and care for, work with, study with, live with. Our reflections on the question will proceed as it will, a good shepherd over us and a paschal lamb among and within us. My hope is that we hear some familiar texts more profoundly grow them more deeply within our experience, and shape our experience into them as we consider them afresh. For our particular journey, I want to consider those two great evangelizers, Jesus and John the Baptist. Ask how each and both tended language and deeds with and for each other in the Gospels we have how they show us a rich example of preaching to and with contemporaries for the gain of many. 
I will suggest how Jesus and John do their shepherd and sheep dance, how it includes us and our partners if we so wish. I will move quickly through the gospel texts where John and Jesus interact, since you have heard these words many times. And there is more to get, or there was for me, as I worked with the tradition in view of this convocation event as I understand it. The texts I am referencing, a few hard copies are available in the room. They are in your Bibles, and they are in fact in our heads and I hope in our hearts. They are new today though, as well as familiar. I have not brought to bear every word that could be included, since, as you know, we have four Gospels, and they all talk quite a bit about Jesus and John, more than I expected. We have some visuals to ponder as well, or I hope we do. We try very hard to have visuals uh, to share that we'll look at in a minute. And so you will consider those as you are inspired to do. I know some of you are staring into the sun, so you may miss out on the visuals. Let the art tend you as well as the words. I hope we can both listen and look at the rich art, be drawn more deeply into the words by what we see. So what's the plan? After we have quickly looked at what I will sketch as good tending, have paced our way through a dance in three movements, I will offer 11 steps more customized for us, but drawing creatively on these passages while using language more directly addressed for this convocation's work. 11 steps is, as you may suspect, not complete. So I hope you will add many more as we go, so that as shepherds and sheep, we have a reliable path. 11 is not a biblical number, but neither is there any reason to stop at 12. So let's see what we see. So Jesus, and you have all this on your handout. Jesus and John dance, three rounds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to offer us something fresh, so consider what I am offering and rearrange it as you like. My main point, John the Baptist and Jesus are in a sort of dance, each a leader and a follower by turns, each as shepherd and as lamb, as indeed they say. Their steps are complementary and coordinated, and they invite us in as well, with our various shepherds and lambs for whom we care and are connected. We, led by Jesus and John, will manage the dance in three movements, engagement, separation, and reflection. I will whirl you, us across these texts briskly, but you can go back later to revisit if you do so, I think you will find I have used the text aptly. So first, in their dance, they engage. John is very early witness to who Jesus is and, of course, to who he himself is, to who we are. And once we are told, at once we are told, John does well. Some accept his testimony, believe, receive but some at once refuse. John thus falls short as a witness, as will Jesus in some ways, too, and as will we. Not everyone will believe, and this is the sadness every witness to truth must expect to be asked to carry. John's appearance is for some a sign of joy and consolation, but for others of doubt, of consternation, of fear, of refusal. Maybe for some people it was both of these. These are steps Jesus will learn as well, and we also, if we can accept it. John is called a prophet, is named Elijah. To be a prophet is the great challenge and responsibility of mediating God's word effectively, 
never an easy thing for many reasons. To study the Hebrew prophets is to wonder why God did not devise a more foolproof way to communicate. Emails, texts, tweets perhaps, not so easily lost in translation and elsewhere. To be a prophet is a role of great vulnerability, as we will see in our second dance movement, though I know you already know that. John refuses the Elijah identity, but Jesus will nonetheless affirm it. Their discussion about it invites us not to look for right wrong, but to ponder how Jesus and how John is Elijah, how not, and what's in it for us. Jesus sees something in John that John misses in himself, and we can profitably stand with each of them. So again, we see John and Jesus not quite agreeing on who John is, prompting all who know him to delve deeper into the question. Maybe John hopes to avoid the Elijah life, since there's a lot of travail before the last chariot ride. John seems to prefer the title of the Isaiah prophet, a sort of road repair role filling in holes and leveling it off, leveling off hills so the walking can be made easy, the journey a joy. We who walk around Berkeley or perhaps bike between Oakland and Berkeley can only imagine how much easier if there were fewer ups and downs as the Isaiah prophet promises to achieve for his journeyers. John is an ascetic from the womb and in his adult life, as we know from his diet, his clothes, his living space. But John is also the best friend at a wedding, enjoying the role of friend of the bridegroom and bride, language Jesus endorses and uses of himself. They agree on that. They live at a love fest, and I hope we think so too. John calls Jesus Lamb of God, Son of God, each term filled with depth and richness and with unfathomable mystery. John mediates God's mercy to the discouraged, to deplorables, we might think, addresses them optimistically. He also speaks confrontationally to his critics. Brood of vipers, murderers and rapists, is not very gracious if it is descriptive. We can ask whether or not such ministry is effective, or better, how, effective, how and when it is effective or not. John is teaching us about tending texts. Though of priestly lineage, John is pretty clearly not a temple priest unwelcome as he would be in his necessarily irregular participation in the religious social codes of his group. John moves the location of ceremonial washings and prayers prescribed as part of Jewish ritual to the mighty Jordan River, where people plunge in and emerge changed, or some do. Introducing Jesus, who has shown up at the river John speaks of God's work given to Jesus in apocalyptic terms. Acts laid to the tree's root, harvest of the field, gleaning of the vintage. The images are intense, a bit threatening, and though they are not absent from Jesus' preaching, they are rare in his mouth. Some scholars think John the Baptist was a Qumran dweller, a member of the Dead Sea community who found temple practice so corrupt that they could no longer participate and so withdrew from it. That is not the choice Jesus makes. Asked about fasting, Jesus will endorse it not as a way of life, but as a response to a season of suffering. So as we come to the end of the first dance movement, the easy engagement between the two, as Jesus is a disciple of John and is baptized and named by John, we see him accepting some of what is said, 
We see him see it fit, see ways in which the two resemble each other. If they began as cousins, colleagues, allies, master teacher, and disciple learner, they now pull apart. So their second dance movement, separation. Deeply into the dance, we reflect that as John is shown to have helped Jesus begin his ministry, announced his coming, characterized him, testified to the nature of Jesus' ministry as prophet, who would on occasion be refused, as lamb and as agent as God, of God's anger, Jesus now moves out on his own. If John was a temple refuser, Jesus is clearly not. Jesus' father is not a priest, and maybe that makes it less complicated for him to stay a temple participant. Jesus has things to say about the temple and its functions, but he says them from a posture of participation. The baptism of John, which Jesus accepts, also initiates Jesus' own now distinct ministry, no longer a disciple of John if he was once that. Jesus' disciples find the matter a bit challenging, as do John's, but the two principles do not compete. The arrest of John is the backdrop for the second part of their dance, occasioning now questions to Jesus about John rather than the former mode of testimony of John about Jesus. The first of these is a question John sends from prison to be presented with urgency to Jesus. Are you the one or is there another? John is perhaps asking if he himself has made a cosmic mistake about his whole life, either mistaking Jesus or mistaking God's call to himself. Perhaps we can hear John as posing the question so that those who, disciples who bring it can hear Jesus respond to their doubt rather than to John's. But we are not far wrong, I think, to sit with John in his last days, wondering if he has spent his time well, has heard well or not. John is instructing Jesus and us, modeling for us all, showing us the tending of shepherds and sheep. Jesus answers the question in terms of the Isaiah language that John had used of himself. No talk of fiery chariots here. Jesus urges that John and his disciples review what they have witnessed, appropriate gifts to the blind, the lame, the diseased, the deaf, the dead, the poor. Jesus is now witnessing to who he himself is, to what John has been, and to what we are asked to be. How John receives the word we can only judge in the manner of his death, which is looming and which he does not seek to avoid. But before that, we hear Jesus speak to his own followers about John in several ways, language of insight for us all. Jesus characterizes John as a prophet, dressed like one, living like one, talking like one, not a soft or diplomatic palace person. Of course, John has been a palace person, speaking right up to King Herod and his partner about the illicitness of their lives. But diplomacy did not much come into it. John has acted like Elijah with that prophet's courageous and costly words to his king and queen. John is the greatest mortal, Jesus says, but also remaining outside the radically new order, Jesus seems to know that, John, that God is creating. Jesus next offers imagery to characterize the life of preaching with humor, but inside as well. No matter what music we played, John and I, you didn't like it. 
Happy music, you folded your arms across your chests. Sad music, you refused to enter the dirge. The challenge for Jesus and John and others after them is not to change the music to please the audience, seductive as that temptation may be. Rather, the issue is why the refusals and how the mesh can be more fruitful. When the musicians and the dancers cannot manage together, there is work for everyone. We may think of Herod himself. John spoke truth to power, as is said, boldly. What you are doing is not right. Herod's reply is his birthday party, when and where he is not able to resist the request of his partner that was once married to Herod's brother or half uncle. And so John dies. While we are noting this phase of their dance, John witnessing to Jesus, showing him what lies ahead, and showing us the same, we can appreciate the fates of these two shepherds and lambs. To have your severed head brought to a birthday party is as disrespectful, dishonorable a fate as can be imagined. Our familiarity with the event may have erased some of its cost. Jesus as well is headed not for decapitation, but for something pretty abusive as well. At his trial process, when Jesus is brought before Herod, he says nothing even when Herod goads him to talk. It is perhaps the reverse image of John's critique of the king. Jesus refuses to say anything that might be interpreted as a plea for Herod's patronage, bold and brave. So their third dance movement, reflection. The next phase of their dance begins as Jesus reflects on John after he has been beheaded. John's life remains for Jesus to draw on, to teach from, to imitate, to shadow. As John has been responding to Jesus' presence and Jesus to John's, so now Jesus responds to the absence of John, as do people who question him about it. We learn that some people, not merely Herod, think Jesus is John. Maybe Herod wishes he could have a second opportunity to hear John on a topic Herod didn't enjoy the first time. Is Herod right or wrong about the John-Jesus overlap? Or rather, where is his sense insightful and where does it fail? The disciples tell Jesus that some of the people they know think Jesus is John or Elijah or a prophet, the prophet. We listening should not be too quick to discount these insights since they are not so wrong as sometimes claimed. Each comes close to truth as Jesus resembles all these figures, draws from them, no doubt studies and relies on their wise courage. But there is more, and Peter, grasping for insight, says something about Jesus that John said earlier, God's Messiah, God's Son. Though whatever Peter glimpsed, the insight immediately recedes, as we know, though to return at a later time. Part of our learning here all of us, I venture, including John, Jesus, Peter, and ourselves, is that these great realities of shepherd and sheep mutually tending are not easy to appropriate, to ready for living into. Peter, next privy to the insights of the transfiguration, where he sees Jesus with Moses and Elijah, these two Jewish veterans of the irregular departure, Peter gets a pale version of what their discussion has to have been. Law and prophets, yes, but also and, and especially the major insight about Jesus that lies ahead, that he will survive the first death, 
be raised from the dead, and bring others along with him. Peter is not ready for that reality yet, and even Jesus does not have to engage it experientially yet. But it is close, coming closer for Jesus, for Peter, for us as we engage it. Peter and the others ask again about the coming, the return of Elijah, and learn again with us that Jesus sees John as an Elijah, whatever that may entail. Among the entailments is that the Elijah, whether named Elijah or John or Jesus, is not going to avoid suffering at the hands of those who fear his presence. We learn additionally that John was favored by the people who saw him as a prophet, such that John's opponents take care not to say something that might affront those who respected John. Some have understood, some have not. But time grows short, and Jesus follows Elijah and John along the road of suffering the consequences of displeasing hearers, seriously displeasing them. But as we know, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are witnesses to the reality of that good news. So reorganizing that dance into 11 steps for us. <clears throat> what are the first 11 steps of our journey, or the 11 plus that we are doing this morning, preceded as they are by many other steps we have taken? What have we learned with John and Jesus? First, deep commitment to the word of God as accessible in Jesus to be offered by us from within the Roman Catholic and Dominican tradition. We must live there, absorb it, digest it, act on and from God's word. John, Jesus, and the evangelists sort God's fresh deed in terms of their valued heritage past, and we will want to do the same. Second, have ears of the heart, lovingly critical of our, own, of our past, of our Dominican past, our Roman Catholic past, our cultural past, our own pasts. As Jesus hears John with his images of sacred violence, Jesus moves his feet to act differently. I suggest we do the same. Our role is not to threaten. Third, Know as deeply as we can do our own motivation for preaching, which is inevitably mixed and complex, stemming from various needs and desires, is of diverse stripes. This is the self-knowledge path. Why do we evangelize? There are lots of reasons, some better than others. We may start with one set of motivations, but we can move to others. Fear and anger are not good incentives. One advantage of a dance, of tending, is to remain on the hop. Fourth, have an openness for our cultures as well as filters for it. It is not just one thing, but adapts frequently and fast and presents different faces to us at different times. Who is our audience of the moment? As we watch John and Jesus with Herod, we can consider whether telling Herod off about his marriage was perhaps best, and we may conclude that it was not. How to engage so that change is more likely. Fifth, Mark diagnose, treat signs of stealth disrespect for our cultures as we are addressing them. Signs of contempt include, but are not limited to, pontificating, denouncing, being right, repeating ourselves endlessly righteously. When we hear ourselves speaking so, we might be concerned as we don't appreciate others doing those things to us. 
We can perhaps conclude from the political event we all went through last fall and the 15 months preceding to hurl insight, insults, both wins and loses elections. But I suggest that disrespect, contempt, is never a good place to stand, never. Disagree, of course, often. Disrespect, no. Sixth, have a clear goal, even when a preaching opportunity is brief. Say, my hope is to offer X. Know what X is explicitly, something worth others' while to hear. The clearer we are about what we hope to suggest, impart, lay out on the table, extend, the clearer others will be, whether they agree or not. At least they will have a better chance of engaging if they have understood our communication and if we have understood it ourselves. Seventh, know what response we anticipate from our addressees, our inter interlocutors. We hope they will do what as a result of our words and why so? We are engaging why. Adjust bravely. What would we like? What is desirable? What do the others need? What do we need? What does God's creation need? Eighth, we try over our lifetimes to align what we say with how we actually live. Check the rear view mirror, the blind spot in the mirror. When someone offers us a friendly suggestion, consider taking it. They may be right. This is an integrity, if never quite achieved, is always to be sought. Ninth, make the tending accessible to the situations we are actually in, which are fresh and changing. Whether we would have chosen them is not the point. If they are present, make them work in both senses of the term. John and Jesus remind us of an urgency we may forget. Tenth, take stock, allow change. Keep alert to what is happening, remain fresh, which happens when we study and deepen, not simply repeat. A challenge when preaching the same lectionary over a lifetime to virtually the same people is to continue to see more deeper, better. Eleventh, our last for the moment. Anticipate that insofar as both John and Jesus fail to convert the hearts of everyone they meet, so will we fail. It is not the worst thing we might do, and to anticipate it and remember our teachers will help us. Moving along, so what's next? I hope you tapped your foot as we watched and listened to Jesus and John do their dance. Responsible, respectful, collaborative, gracious, without in any sense being weak or whimsical. The insights we reviewed are challenging for us, for our culture, in a variety of ways. We are sometimes with John or with Jesus, sometimes attending shepherd, and no doubt often a resisting lamb, digging little hooves in out of fear or some other impulse. There are corrupt shepherds and generous sheep as well. There is plenty to hear, to share, to offer, to be shaped by ourselves. Jesus and John show a space between them, yes, but it is loving and gentle, not competitive. I hope we can and you will include their example, their participation, as we move through this wonderful program, thinking about the many ways in which we study and are shaped by and can be more deeply understood, critiqued, extended, and offered to others. Jesus and John the Baptist pray for us. Thank you very much.